Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Limited Time Only. I'm your host, just like every week, and I am joined by my co-host, Drew. What's up, Drew? Oh, nothing much. Losing hey. the finals of a... I was just going to say, <laughs> you lost in the finals of a PPT. <laughs> yeah, it's... Kind of, kind of sucks, but it's fine. There's, there's two more this weekend. They're not limited though, so. Uh, yeah, I, losing in the finals of PPTQs is the worst. It's hard because you want to be back in 2013, you know, when you didn't have to play in PPTQs, you know, and you could just go to PTQs, but you have to win a PPTQ to go to 2013. So. I think, uh, I think losing in the finals of a PPTQ is a lot less harsh. Oh, then, losing then the finals of the PTQ? Yeah. The finals of the PTQ is, like, oh, yeah. nightmarish. It's nope. like... I've, I, I've been there. I mean, I, I remember, yeah, when I got I got second in a PTQ, and it was just literally, I was just, like, I was pretty crestfallen. I just was like, I just want to win this. I just want to go to the Pro Tour really bad. And, um, and plus the days are longer. You know what I mean? Usually PTQs were at least seven rounds. Right. Um, and then, you know, you battle your way through the top eight. Um, and a lot of times they had a break, too, you know, between uh, rounds. I don't know, maybe maybe just like a short break or whatever. But point is, you end up, you know, at the store all day. Um, you get to the finals. You know, it's just you and that guy and then the judge and then maybe some people left in the store. And you lose and you're just like, ugh, it's terrible. <laughs> the first the first PD I lost in the finals of was against um, uh, Daniel Gardner. And um, so he's a he's a grinder that's done well at GPs with like uh, team GPs with Christian Calcano. Um, he's a really good friend of mine. I love that guy. Uh, but it's like the we I'm helping Alex test for it was for Pro Tour Gate Crash and I'm helping Alex test for the Pro Tour and I get a text from Daniel that's like oh, man I should have conceded to you I don't want to go to this thing and I'm like I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you see LSV recently put on Twitter? I don't know what exactly they were talking about, but he did mention something about uh, he actually had several times early on uh, when he first started playing Magic that he was qualified for the Pro Tour and didn't go, so... <laughs> oh, so that's your excuse now? Yeah, yeah, it justifies it, right? I mean, if LSV did it, then it's fine if I did it, too, right? So. <laughs> let's uh, let's get right into this four-time Pro Tour not-competitor truth. <laughs> so we're going to check out our sponsors at um, uh, puremtgo.com, mtgotraders.com, and game, play at gamegrid.com. Um, the play at Game Bird store or the Game Bird store is about to open in Salt Lake City sometime soon. I know that they just opened one up in Logan as well as uh, uh, Lehigh. So check out all those stores um, and stay tuned for when they start selling sealed product online and stuff like that for you guys to buy. Um, but yeah, don't forget that this podcast is brought to you by you guys by joining patreon.com slash ccmtg and becoming a patron of the Constructivism family. Everything is appreciated. Um, it's starting at one dollar. You can donate any amount that you see fit. But let's get right into the podcast. So this week uh, we're going to do a pick two on uh, Eternal Masters. Pick two is when we pick pick two cards out of the pack, but the picks are for pick two and three. Um, we're going to do Eternal Masters, and it is brought to you by Five Color Combo. We're using Magic Drafter, the app on my iPhone, to do this, and the uh, the owners of the app at fivecolorcombo.com are nice enough to sponsor this podcast and sponsor this segment. And I, I use this app literally all the time. So let's get right into this. Uh, first pick, we uh, – we, it was it was an okay pack. It was an okay pack. We uh, we picked up a Crater Hellion, so that was good. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's a pretty good, uh, good way to start the draft. Yeah, it was pretty good. Um our next options are for Cephalid, uh Sage. That card is three and a blue for a two-three um, with threshold. As long as seven or more cards are in your graveyard, uh, when Cephalid Sage enters the battlefield, draw three cards, then discard two cards. Uh, certainly not a second pick. Um, I think I've played this guy once in a deck, but he tends to be like a 23rd card, so... The next card is Cidic Wayfinder. It's two and a green for a 2 2 Oak Warrior Druid. Uh, and when it enters the battlefield, it's your library for a basic land card. Put the card into your hand and then shuffle your library. 
Uh, I like this guy. Surprisingly, though, he wasn't quite as good, I think, as I thought he would be um, in this set. But he's still he's still good. I mean, he's still like a great mana fixer. Uh, also still appreciated in the black green elf deck. So just still a solid green creature. Yeah, I think that card is just solid. Probably hoping to get something a little bit better on this pick, though. Yep. Dragon Egg is next. It's two and a red for an O2 Dragon Defender. When it dies, put a 2-2 dragon with fire breathing onto the battlefield. Uh, this is a great uh, synergy card in the black-red sacrifice decks, but it's the kind of card that you would rather be picking up in the middle picks. It's not a card you want to be picking certainly this early. So We have Welkin Guide. It's 4 and a white for a 2-2. When it enters the battlefield, target creature is plus 2, plus 2, and flying. Uh, not unplayable, but again, like Seth would say, it's probably just a 23rd card you're going to pick up later in a draft, so... Orgish or Flame is three and a red for an enchantment. Attack creatures you control get plus one plus O. Oh. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone cast this card. I think that I've seen chat. people pick this card and then realize that it was bad and cut it. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's good in a very dedicated tokens deck, uh, but even then you're just kind of like, this is just way worse than Intangible Virtues, so... Next up we have Ka Ka. Uh, Squadron Hawk. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> See, I'm not going to actually... Do you want me to actually caw? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to get, like, a sound effect or something of, like, a really annoying seagull. <laughs> mine, 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 <laughs> mine. That one. Uh, yeah, so Squadron Hawk is surprisingly uh, a little bit better. Yeah, I think than people had originally anticipated. Um, Which usually... is weird, because it was good in the last draft format it was in, too. I don't know why people thought, like... Well, it's just, you know, Eternal Masters is, like, it, it's a more powerful draft format, right? But you so have I mean, Raincore. You can put a Raincore on a Squadron Hawk. Yeah, but, I mean, it's kind of weird because, do you, like, is Green White wanting to play Squadron Hawks? I don't uh, know. It depends on how many Squadron Hawks <laughs> I have. I mean, uh, I mean, blue, th this card's great in, like, the Blue-White Flyers deck. It is. Um, uh, and it's still pretty good, like, in the Red-White Aggressive decks as well. Obviously, you need... If you have two, it's okay. If you have no, you three, want three to five. Yeah, you you want at least three for it to be a really solid card, and then when you have like four or something, it's still really good. Uh, the thing with Squadron Hawk is generally what you want to do is you want to try and pick these. I don't know if you want to pick these early. I think I I've think seen some. If people... you get a fifth pick Squadron Hawk, you should take it. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, especially if you don't have like another pick, really, you should probably just take it and kind of hedge. Just be like, well, you know, if I see more Squadron Hawks, I can start prioritizing them higher. But I don't, I don't really want to take this second pick. No, no. I no. want to wait a couple of picks. But if, like I, like I said, if you see this like around pick five, then you're like, well, I could do that. Yeah, that's a thing I could do. Yep. Yeah. So, next up we have Dream Twist. Really unexciting. It's an instant top pl pl player puts the top three cards of the library in the graveyard for Flashback 2. It's blue and one. Uh, we're not taking that. Uh, Lys Alana Huntmaster is two green green for a 3-3 three, three elf warrior. And whenever you summon an elf, uh, put a 1-1 one, one green elf onto the battlefield. I love this card. Uh, I believe it's, isn't it when you cast an elf spell? It, I said summon, but it is cast an elf spell. Yeah, so like I like ending triggers it as well. Um, but yeah, this is the this is the great top end for your elf deck, right? You know, usually your elf deck is like some elvish vanguards, uh, hopefully a timber watch elf or two, some land of war elves, and then you top off with Huntmaster, and then like you just get to every single elf you play is just like making tons of elves. Yeah, Huntmaster is like one of the great archetypes, uh, or yeah, archetype set of pieces for. Uh, one of the yeah. good decks. I'm moving this up. Deck. This is the best card in the pack by a lot so far. So far, yeah. Elite Vanguard is next. It is just as a Van Alliance. <laughs> so it's a 2 1 for 1 white. Not exciting. Nope. Abrax is next. It's 3 green or 3 red red for a 3 3 beast with haste. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an Abrax reveal it and put it in your hand. It also has uh, baby fire breathing, right? It, you can yeah, it has red, red one fire breathing. Yeah, um, this this card is actually better than it looks. Um, I know it doesn't seem like it's that great, but if you have like three of these, like similar to Squadron Hawk, I was just gonna say if you have a Squadron Hawk number of these, yeah, I think even two is pretty good um, because yeah. like 
it, it has a much bigger body. It has like a much bigger impact on the board than Squadron Hawk does, right? Like Squadron Hawk, you play it and you're like, okay, you got a one one flyer. You know, you get one or two other one one flyers. This comes out and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm getting smashed by like this plus whatever creatures you have plus another one is coming next turn. Every time I've seen someone playing Avarax, it's been like, wow, this is like one of the biggest creatures in play. It's doing a ton of damage. Yeah, Avarax is surprisingly much better than it looks, which is funny because I remember Avarax actually even being played in block constructed for a little bit. Um, again, power level of constructed was for a little bit less than it was today. Yeah, but I still, still don't know that I would take this over a Huntmaster, though. No, I wouldn't take it over a Huntmaster, but it is it is a card I think that uh, was probably underrated when the set first came out. But I think people are starting to appreciate the power level of the card a little bit more. Well, let's uh, let's humble ourselves for this one. It's one in a white for an instant, and you until end of turn, your target creature keeps all abilities, but has a base power and toughness of zero one. Doesn't it lose all abilities? Or does it keep all abilities? It loses all abilities. I read that wrong. Okay. Um, yeah, it's okay. It's it's, a, it's an okay white trick. Uh, pseudo removal spell. But yeah, yeah I, I taking, would still think Huntmaster. Taking Huntmaster over. Now we have our uncommons. We have him to Torok. Mm. It's black, black for a sorcery. Target player discards two cards at random. Um, I'm So I'm not as high on him to Torok as I think a lot of other people are, but I still think it's a good card. Um... It also, I think, conveniently pairs pretty well with Crater Hillian, because uh, I think there's, like, black-red control decks are pretty good. Um, so I might shuffle this to the front of the pack and be debating between this and Huntmaster at this point. Chestro Mask is two and a green for an enchantment aura. Enchanted Creature gets plus two, plus two for each other enchantment on the battlefield. Uh, this is one of the key cards for the enchantment deck, but I... I don't know that it is. I think it's fine think in that so? deck, but I don't know that it's key. Like, uh, Abundant Growth is key in that deck. You have to draft Abundant Growths in that deck, otherwise your deck doesn't work. And this deck is, like, one that you will just get one of. Sure, but, I mean, this is an uncommon, so you're definitely going to see way less of this than, say, sure. Abundant Growths or Yavimai Enchantresses. Um, and we obviously haven't seen any of those. So if you really like the deck, I could certainly see taking this. But oh, yeah, I, if you took this now, then you would be the only one in this deck. Yeah, uh, but I, I, again, I don't really like the enchantment deck, so I would rather take uh, Huntmaster here or, like I said, him to Torox. So. I do like the enchantment deck, but I would still take Huntmaster. Uh, we have Wee Dragon Outs. It's one blue red for a one three flyer. Uh, it's a fairy wizard, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, it gets plus two plus zero until end of turn. Uh, this is also a pretty good creature. Um, you can finish off opponents pretty quickly with this, depending on your deck, obviously. Um, most blue red decks do tend to have a lot of spells in them: Silent Departures, Firebolts, Deep Analysis. Uh, there's a lot of great great common spells, so this is a pretty good fit in those decks. Um, so, yeah, so this, this is a pretty good creature. It is multicolor, but we already do have a red card, so I don't feel like it's too bad if you take Wee Dragonauts here. So, again, I'm... Take? Uh, so, are those all the cards? I'm guessing the rare was taken out, it sounds like. Yep. Um, I think I would take... I don't think I would take Hunt Master. Um, I think Hunt Master is good, but I do think... I think I would take him. I think I would take him to Torog. Hmm. I don't think that I would take him. Um, I, th I think I would take Huntmaster. That's fair. Um, I mean, Hunt Huntmaster just like if you're taking Huntmaster though, you're basically taking, uh, you're you're saying okay, I have Huntmaster and I have Crater Hellion, and these are two cards that will not be in the same deck together. I mean, there's a slight possibility if that that happens, but if it does, your draft is probably a train wreck. Um, Whereas I think Himnatorak is a card that can go great in a Crater Hillian deck. Sure. That is true, but I I think that Huntmaster I'm not gonna be I'm not really married to that pick, so I'm not I don't I don't think that I don't know that uh, Crater Hellion's really good. Um <laughs> I mean you're kind of I, taking Huntmaster kind of gives you it gives you options in the next couple packs, right? You can be like, Am I gonna get past a Timber Watch Elf, and if you get, like, a third or fourth pick Timber Watch Elf, you can be like, boom, Elves, going for it, you know. Um, or you can be like, hey, look, I got a um, uh, pass, I don't know, what's a really good, uh, like, like Chain Lightning. I'd be surprised if someone has a Chain Lightning, though. But you can be like, boom, Chain Lightning. We passed Chain Hellion. Lightning to take the Crater Hellion. Um, yeah, so... 
<laughs> yeah, so I think, I mean, it, but yeah, t- taking the Huntmaster does give you kind of the wedge option, the, or the fork option, right, where you're like, you know, I can see what's happening to the right of me, um, yeah. which, I, which I think is fine. Uh, but I do feel like if I take him to Torak, um, and I do see the Elf cards coming, then I can jump in and just be like, well, I'd maybe just have one less Huntmaster in my deck, which is kind of eh, but like, I don't feel too badly about it. Let's, uh, let's go on to the next pick. We have Giant Tortoise. He gets plus... It will plus three as long as it's untapped. It's blue and one. We're not taking that here. Um, Innocent Blood is one black for a source for each player sacrifice as a creature. Um, this card's value, like... Do you see by the number of dragon eggs that you have in play? Well, it just it just varies so dramatically. Like, there's some there's some control decks that don't play a lot of creatures. Like, I've seen blue-black control decks with, like, four creatures, and this is pretty solid in those decks, because you never have a creature in place. So you just, like, kill your worst creature. Um... It's great in the red black sacrifice deck, like you said, um, because it is a sacrifice outlet, which uh, sometimes you do need. Um, and then it's pretty bad versus like red white tokens. <laughs> the next card that we have up is raise the alarm. We're not taking that either. Nope. Seal of cleansing, not taking that. Roots coming up probably to the front out of all these cards. Still not that great. It's green and three for an enchantment uh, enchant creature without flying when it enters the battlefield. Tap target creature. That creature doesn't untap. It's fine. It's better than people think it is. Uh, Roots is eh. It's like it's better than Drew thinks it is. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't think Roots is that great. Um, so. it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's better than Drew thinks it is. <laughs> Next up is a great card though. That's Firebolt. It's uh, a sorcery. It deals two damage to a creature player with flashback five. Oh yeah, this is going way to the front of the pack. I'm a, I'm taking that roots and tossing it out of the draft. <laughs> Ripping it up. Uh, <laughs> so Elite Vanguard, we already said we're not taking. Twisted Abomination is next. That card's quite good. It's five and a black for Zombie Mutant. It's got black to regen for one, uh, and then it's has Swamp Cycling for two. Uh, yeah, Twisted Abomination is great. Uh, is it helps. better than Firebolt? Probably not. No, no. But it, it but it is still a, a very very good black card. I like Twisted Abomination. Twisted A Bomb a lot. Uh, we have Undying Rage, two and a red for uh, Enchanted Creature, gets plus two, plus two, can't block. When it uh, dies, when it goes to your graveyard, put it back into your hand. Not taking that. Dismal Backwater, that's the blue, 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 white, uh, sorry, blue, black, gain life land. Um, we Dragonauts again. And then our Uncommons, our other two are quite good. Which one should I read first, the red one or the black one? Uh, let's go with the red one. It is two and a red for an enchantment. And when you cast a spell from your graveyard... Burning Vengeance still is two damage target creature or player. All right, Burning Vengeance is a good one. What's the black one? Well, how good is Burning Vengeance getting you off a of Firebolt? You know, at the Third beginning of the three. draft format, I would have, but I I have played the Burning Vengeance deck a couple times, and every time I've been kind of unimpressed with it. Okay, it's it's decent. Like I I, I win matches with it, but I'm not like, oh man, I'm crushing my opponents. Um. It might still just be better than Firebolt. It might still just be powerful enough to justify taking it over Firebolt, but I, I don't, I don't think it's like quite the windmill slam first pick that you took. But the nice thing is, if you have both Burning Vengeance and Firebolt in this pack, you can feel pretty confident that. That's my thought. Is like right. I see two cards that are like, I would take that Burning Vengeance. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 depending on what the black uncommon is. All right, all right. It's is black. It it's black, black two for a two on first try. Solve it. <laughs> Solve it. When it enters the battlefield, the strict target non artifact, non black creature can be regenerated. Necrotal is also great. Um, I, I, th- I think I take Burning Vengeance here. Um, I, I, I mean, I, even though my experiences haven't been great with Burning Vengeance, I still think it's good enough to justify taking it over a very good black uncommon and a great uh, red, red common. And, and you, you're going to feel pretty confident at this point that, yes, red is open to my right, which is awesome because you get to play with Crater Helion, and so you could probably draft a pretty good Burning Vengeance control deck with Crater Helion in it. So. Yeah. I would take Burning Vengeance. Yeah. <laughs> I To be fair, Necrotol is like... Oh, yeah, Necrotol is great. I mean, like, you know, it's in any sort of black deck because, you know, you end up with some Grave Diggers and, like, it just keeps coming back. And uh, it's good in blue black, too, with, like, Silent Departures. I've done that before where you're just like, I'm just going to keep pick, picking my Necrotol up, so... All right, let's, uh, let's move on to 
our biggest movers. This week we're going to talk about Eternal Masters. What has moved for you the most since we last talked about Eternal Masters? Um, yeah, I think I honestly just going back to uh, to like Burning Vengeance. Um, I'm I, I'm a little bit down on it. Again, I'm not I'm not sitting over a Necrotal. You can't be that down on it. Well, I mean, like I. I, I, there's, there's a lot of like rares I'd probably take over it, but I mean, I, I, I think I'm taking Burning Vengeance with like this kind of a little bit more begrudging, like, all right, fine, take your Burning Vengeance, like, I, I guess I'm gonna try and make this work or whatever. It's a um, third pick Burning Vengeance, right? Like, that's a with, with a, with a Firebolt in the pack. So yeah. No, cer- certainly the the deck is open, and I I think that's the case for any Eternal Masters, right? Is really you're you're trying to find like, all right, what archetypes are open here? You know, if if, if a particular archetype is open, then you want to be in that archetype. Um, so yeah, uh, flyers in general are very good in Eternal Masters, a lot better than I had. Like obviously, flyers are always good. That's always going to be kind of a truth of Magic, but it, they were better in Eternal Masters than I thought they would be. Um, you'd be surprised how often you're dying to like an army of flyers in there. So okay, um, for me, it's Lenore Elves. Um, I, I think that it's often hard. It's often easy to forget how good Llanowar Elves are in formats like Eternal Masters, because in normal formats, they're they're fine. Like, you're going to play your Arbor Elves when you get them, and you really, really want, like, Centaurs in those decks. But in Eternal Masters, you just want as many Llanowar Elves as you can have, because the mana advantage and the tempo that you get from having one is worth the card in a format where cards are so much more powerful. If I get to play my 3-drop and my 4-drop before you... I, it's worth spending that card for. Lanawar Elves is great. Newsflash from 1994. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Tristan. <laughs> um, the other one that it did move for me ha, has moved up to quite a bit for me is actually Seal of Strength. Um, I have drafted that green white deck again. I, I think I think the card is actually I think that deck is actually good and Drew's down on it too much. Eh, maybe I am, uh, and maybe it, it, it's it's probably got enough power. I did actually see someone draft it and. They were literally, they had like three Abundant Growth in play, and they're just like, you have a Mind Enchantress, you have a Mind Enchantress, you have yeah, a Mind Enchantress. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And I was abundant like, Growth is like, like the man, best part of like that deck. Man, those are like three mana 5-5s, like. <laughs> yeah, that's how the deck was, that's why when you were like, I don't know, that deck's good, that's exactly what was happening to me. I Once I learned that you just wanted to take all the Abundant Growths, the deck become, became legitimately sweet. Yeah, no, it's, it's. It's still an archetype you can certainly draft. It's just, I don't know. I I guess I'm just kind of like, eh, because it's just... Because it's green-white? No, it's it's not because it's green-white. It's just because, like, um, it, it, it feel, it, that feels like one of the decks that things can kind of go wrong with, right? Like, if you don't get any of my enchantresses, like, if you only have one or two... Oh, yeah, heaven forbid that your deck is full of rain cores and elephant guides and armadillo cloaks and you didn't get it. Well, sure, but I mean, the, that kind of deck I think is a little more, like, fragile maybe than the, I have six Yavamaya Enchantress, or whatever it is, however many you have, you know, a whole bunch of Yavamaya Enchantresses, because the advantage of Enchantress is it's cheap, it comes down immediately, and you don't have to spend multiple turns suiting it up. It just literally just comes down, and you're like, how big is that? Oh, it's huge, you know, um, and it's not like, it's not like using, like, a Mana War or Silent Departure on, it's that great. It's decent, but it's not It's not as good as, like, okay, I played a three-drop, okay, I suited it up with an Elephant Guide, oh, you bounced it. You know, like, much, much worse tempo uh, when that happens, as opposed to just, I play Yavah Mind Enchantress on turn three, oh, you bounced it, okay, it's back next turn, so. Sure. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to our, I think that's, do you have anything you want to say about Eternal Masters? I think it might stay on motor for a while. I think they might turn it into a world's format. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people saying they want it as a, as the world's format, which would be awesome. I would love to see. I would love to see that as a world's format. I also think it'd be fun to do uh, cube as a world's format. Um, anything. I, that's actually one of my favorite parts of the worlds is uh, is watching whatever cool draft they're doing. Um, just because the draft format is so much fun, and it's awesome seeing the best players in the world, how they approach the format. Yeah, so they break into, like, teams of three or four people and then, like, try and break the whatever the limited format is, and that's fun to watch. Yep, absolutely. So, um, I do hope... I, I've, I'm i enjoying Eternal Masters. I've been doing a few drafts when I get the time, and I honestly... 
think it's better than I thought it was. I thought it was like really fun at first, and then I was like kind of down on it. And then now we have interesting questions like how many curtips would you play? And that's that's a fun format. Ten. It's not ten. The answer is ten. <laughs> it's got to be six. <laughs> no man, it's like ten. Come on, like if you go like turn one curt ape, turn two curt ape. You're probably turn three, curt ape, you're, curt ape. <laughs> you're probably right. <laughs> And then, like, you know, they're like, ha I played a 3-3. You're like, whatever, this credit doesn't care. He's going to die for the cause and get six more <laughs> points of damage in. There's more coming. All right. <laughs> but the thing is, is you can't go Curdape, Curdape, Curdape. No, but you can go Curdape, Curdape. I mean, if you're on the play and you go turn one, two, three, turn two, two, three, and then turn three, two, three, two, three, like, that's pretty good. <laughs> Like what? Like what creatures have three power at that point in the curve? I'm just saying that like you're not. It's not like you're playing one drop, double one drop, triple one drop, right? Yeah, sure. But I mean, like, th- th- there's a reason. Curd ape is like when I play. How many elite vanguards would I play in my deck? Two, maybe. One. Like I would play one elite. Vanguard. Yeah, and even then you're kind of like, eh. But like curd ape is just like whatever. Like I'm just smashing past everything in the early turns of the game. Like, nothing can block me, nothing can, like... Oh, I do want to say that, that Coalition Honor Guard is a nightmare for that green-white deck. I should mention that. Oh, yeah. I mean, Honor Guard's really good by itself anyways, so... Yeah, but you don't actually play removal. <laughs> <laughs> You're you like, need... I guess I'll pacifism it. Yeah. <laughs> you have, like... You need Swords to Plowshares in that deck if you're going to beat that card. Yeah, Honor Guard is... It's like the... It's like the souped-up version of Spell Skype for that... Versus that deck, right? All right, so this week, uh, for our training grounds, every week on the show, we're going to talk about something to help you in either limited magic or life in general. Um, And this week, I want to talk about how to handle spoiler season. I think that for players who love limited, spoiler season is a little bit different. And I think that some people fall into the traps that exist for constructed players and limited and what I mean by that is they dictate the format of limited based upon the things that are presented to them at the beginning of spoiler season. And that's a pretty big trap. I think I think I did that when I first started playing Magic Drew, did you? Um so whenever I look at I'm trying to think how it was but how how was it then? I guess what? it could be completely different. You played Magic years ago, they might not have had spoiler season. They did, um, but it was nowhere near as big. It was mostly like I think the Magic website would put like one or two cards up, kind of. Um, and I don't remember ever. I'm trying to think when I first started going to like websites like MTD Salvation or whatever to look at the sets. Um, but I definitely do remember going to. I think the first pre-release I went to. Did I go to a Scourge pre-release? I can't remember if I did or not. I definitely went to a Mirrodin pre-release. Um, and I don't think I knew all the cards when I went to the pre-release. So it really was one of those, oh, this is me experiencing the set for the first time, um, kind of looking at all the cards. Um, and certainly, you know, I mean, I was newer then, and there was kind of that whole, like, oh, this looks like a really cool card, and it can do cool things kind of a thing. Um, now I'm a little more grizzled, and I'm much more like, all right, what does this card do, like, in a sealed environment or a draft environment? Like, you know, it's a much more kind of practical approach to it. Um, but, yeah, when I first started playing, definitely it was more what are kind of the co- some of the fun, cool things you can do um in the set or how cards interact or whatever two card combos things like that so which which i think that's that's a decent approach i think that a lot of people will see the rares and the the like the bombiest of the bombs and think that that's how the format's going to play out um and that's that's not exactly the approach that you should be taking during spoiler season for a limited player So we're going to go over a few things to kind of talk about, like, what we're going to be looking at. And one of the first things that I'd like to talk about is looking at mechanics. Um, When I mean looking at mechanics, I mean, like, what is the set doing as a cohesive strategy in Limited? So let's talk about Escalate really quick. Because this is a very – it's – let's talk about Kicker. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So uh, there's a cycle of uncommons, for example, that – that are going to be pretty good in the in the limited format, and this is 
But I, I want to talk about knowing that a card's going to be good and how they impact limited. So Escalate is basically here. So what it does is when you play this spell, you can choose additional modes for the card if you pay their Escalate cost. So for example, we have a white one for its Blessed Alliance. It's in Elder Moons. By the way, spoiler alert? I don't know. <laughs> um, so it's one and a white for instant and you can escalate it for two mana and what it does is when you cast it you're going to choose the modes and then if you chose to escalate it you're going to choose more modes so its modes are choose one or more target player gains four life untap up to two target creatures or target opponent sacrifices a attacking creature so the important thing to note is it's choose one or more. So you can't choose like them to sacrifice two creatures. Yes. That is not what you can do. No. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, this card would be broken. So it's important to know the rules of the set and the way that cards work before evaluating them during spoiler season. So, Drew, how do you evaluate this kind of card? The, or these kinds of cards, because I think that the black one is great. Um, I, I I think the white one's pretty good. Um, I think – so basically what I like to do for, for limited when I look at a card is I think to myself, with a card like this especially, because it's basically kicker, right? It's like some weird combination of kicker and entwine kind of. Yeah. Um, but I think I it's like, actually a sweet mechanic, by the way. I think that this is far more interesting than kicker and multi-kicker ever were. Sure. It, yeah, it's just kind of an evolution or a variation on kicker, entwine, multi-kicker, those kind of things. Um, so what I like to do with cards is I like to look at kind of what I think of as the base, what I uh, kind of a base paradigm for the card. Which to me, the base paradigm for this card is um, would I play this card by itself without um, the option to escalate it? Yes. And the question is, would I play something that was one in a white? target player sacrifices an attacking creature. Yes, I would. Um, it's not the best removal spell, because again, obviously they get the choice, but it's not bad. Um, it's cheap, which is always a plus in its favor. Um, and you can do things like, you know, you can block, let their creatures die during combat, and then still at in the combat damage step at the end, you can be like, all right, I'm going to play this. Now you sacrifice the creature I didn't block or whatever. Or the yeah. creature that I chumped off, that was huge. Let's um, be real here. Wing Shards is like a legit magic card. Uh, I played Wing Shards in Constructed. Yeah, and this so. card costs one less. Yeah. Uh, now, to be fair, Wing Shards was uniquely positioned in that format. Because, it also had Storm, so... Yeah, and that's why it was uniquely positioned, because Goblins was one of the biggest aggressive decks when Wing Shards was legal during both Block Constructed and Standard. So obviously Goblins wants to play a bunch of creatures post or pre-combat so because it has war chief in play so it'll be like goblin 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 and then it attacks you and you're like all right wing shards for five or whatever you know i mean that didn't always happen but that was the ideal uh play but back to blessed alliance um yeah so baseline i would play this card pretty easily one in a white target player sacrifices a creature um would i play this card if i if it just gave me choices you know would i always play target player or target opponent sacrifices a creature yes would I play it if it gave me the choice to maybe gain four life? Sure, because sometimes in a pinch, you'd rather – you're like, I need to gain four life rather than have them stack at a creature. Um, kind of a corner case. But having that choice is always great on a magic card. Um, now the fact that you get to possibly kick this and have something like, you know, have a maybe slightly worse version of Silver Strike, right? You know, target player sacrifices a creature, uh, attacking creature, and you gain four life. Like, sure, it's a little bit worse than Silver Strike, but it's still a card that I would play. Um, so that's kind of how I like to approach cards, is I like to think to myself, and, and actually the untapping creatures is also relevant as well, right? Because there's certainly situations where you're racing, and your opponent attacks with three creatures, and you go, boom, sack a creature, untap two creatures, block with my two creatures, which could lead to, like, pretty big blowouts. Um, so so th that's how you just break down this mechanic, right? But you yeah. can take that mindset into any mechanic, right? Yeah. We could look at Madness the same way, right? Like, would I play this card if I don't have its Madness cost? That's the, the, the frame that Drew is putting these cards into. He's separating them from the set to evaluate the card. And this is the base point of evaluating cards. And one of the reasons that Drew does this is Drew doesn't know 
what mechanics are going to be good and bad just by looking at them usually. Obviously, if there's a mechanic that's like, draw three cards every time you cast a spell, yeah, that's a strong mechanic. Obviously, that mechanic's going to be good. But, like, that's not how they make mechanics, right? Um, also, you also notice that Drew went back to his looking at things like Entwine and like Kicker, right? He took his knowledge from Kicker and applied it to evaluating this card. Um, we can do the same thing if we look at Emerge. So Emerge is a mechanic that you may cast this spell for by sacrificing creature rather than playing the cost... Uh, Paying the emerge cost reduced by that creature's converted mana cost. Let's read that again. You may cast this spell by sacrificing a creature and paying the emerge cost reduced by that creature's converted mana cost. Yeah, so emerge I think is actually um, – so I, I think escalate's fairly easy to evaluate because you're basically just saying would I baseline play this spell? Yes, no. Like the black one you were talking about, I think it's the rare, right? You know, one in a black uh, – uh, you can have target creature get minus two minus two until end of turn, which snap off. I would play that. You know, if it was if it was literally just a sorcery, one in a black target creature gets minus two minus two until end of turn. Play that. It's that's easy to evaluate. The escalate is almost just kind of like a sweet bonus that you can right. get. Um, emerge, I think, is harder to evaluate, mostly because um, emerge feels like so, you can, can are... Can you explain what it does really quick? Cause... Yeah, basically Emerge is just you are playing a creature at a discounted rate by sacrificing another creature. So, so for example, I have Wretched Griff. It costs 7 mana. By the way, I'm playing Devil's Advocate here for this wondering. Sure. So this card costs 7 mana for a 3-4 flyer, and when, it enter, and when you cast it, I get you get a draw card. And then it has Emerge for blue 5. So if I sacrifice a creature, I get to cast this for 6? Uh no, you get to you get to cast it for six minus whatever the co the converted mana cost of the creature you sacrifice. What if I sacrifice a token? Uh, you it's zero, so I don't think you get a discount. Correct. So so basically, if I have a wall of omens in play that's got my me my value, mm -hmm. and I emerge my wall of omens, I get to cast this card, this three four flyer that when I cast it, I get a draw card. I get to cast it. For five mana or no four mana four mana three three and a blue and you can't you cannot reduce the uh, colored mana cost so even if you like five and a blue like let's say you had uh, drowner of hope and you said I want to sacrifice my drowner of hope to play my wretched griff for zero you can't you still have to pay a blue for it correct okay so so how do we evaluate this so yeah so the, so what I was saying is that so emerge is Classically speaking, sacrificing another creature to play a creature is not good. Um, just, I mean, because it's that whole, you're two for one in yourself, right? You're giving up a creature to well, play another creature. Even with Retscript, what's important to know, this may draw you a card, right? So you actually don't lose anything by casting your Retscript, except on board presence. Right. Um, it's that old saying that's like, a dollar today is worth two dollars tomorrow or whatever. You're you're giving up two dollars today for a dollar tomorrow, or maybe yeah. three dollars tomorrow. I don't know what the card would be. It could be a boat, but like you're you're definitely losing an on board creature, which is which is different than a card in some ways, right? An on board creature is something you've already invested in, whereas a card is something that you can invest in, and there's a difference there. There's some you've already spent money on that. Two two right? That two two is already in play. You already you already spent the mana that you had that turn. The you already have used your allotted mana for a turn just to get that two two into play, and that's what's important there. Yeah, um, it's it's definitely one of those things where you're you're giving up a guarantee, right? You're guaranteed to have whatever the creature you have in play. So let's let's say a grizzly bear. So you're guaranteed. I have a Grizzly Bear in play. I'm, if I want to emerge this Wretch Griff, I have to give up the Grizzly Bear, uh, and I lose it. And you're drawing a card off the top of your deck. Now, so in terms of cards, if we if we are assuming a Grizzly Bear is worth one card, and a card from your deck is worth one card, which is generally how people evaluate things, um, then you are, quote-unquote, even on cards. But you are most likely negative on tempo in one sense, Right, because in one sense you've given up a two-two 
um, as opposed to maybe playing something else that was four mana in your hand. You know, let's say I had like a hill giant, right? So I could have played a hill giant. So I could have had a three three and a two two instead of one three four flyer. Um, and you know, if your opponent has an answer for your three four flyer, um, you know, if they have a way to remove it, if they have a way to bounce it, anything like that, you now all of a sudden have no creatures in play, um, which gives your opponent a very big tempo advantage. Um, because again, we're talking about Redgrift in the sense that, you know, you're replacing the card you sacrifice because you draw a card. Well, uh, that's but, not true. Of, let's be clear. That's not true of all emerge cards. Right, exactly. There may be emerge cards that, um, like, let's say there was a vanilla emerge creature. It'd be much harder, I think, to sell me this is, on a vanilla This is emerge. the only common emerge creature that have, we've been shown. Yes, that's been spoiled. Um, now, the Mythic, I think, is worth playing <laughs> the, the I, green one yeah because the mythic one probably just ends the game on this yeah i also think that the mythic rare is worth playing drew yeah um so i mean that's that's the thing really is you you're you can make kind of baseline evaluations and say something like yes i'm by playing wretch griff i may be giving up some valuation but a three four flyer is quite large um, yeah. especially for a flying creature um, and if your opponent doesn't have an answer for it, it can be pretty dominant in terms of how it's. Uh... And it could be that it could be that we don't know what the rest of the common emerge cards look like. But that's that's kind of the next step that I want to talk about. I want to talk about looking at big picture, right? We look at Retchgriff and we think, and we can't so we can't evaluate the ability emerge off of Retchgriff, right? And we certainly can't value it off of the Mythic Rare. Yeah, it's a boar. It's a uh, decimator of provinces. Yes, Eldrazi Boar. Yeah, so for the most wondering, that card, when it enters the battlefield, uh, creatures you control get plus two, plus two, and gain trample until end of turn. When you cast. Not yeah. When it oh, battle. yeah, when you cast it. Whatever. Um. <laughs> so so it's an overrun that leaves behind a 7-7, seven, seven, and that's powerful. Oh, and it has trample and haste. Yes. You're, if, if, if somebody casts this, or emerges it, or whatever, and they have, like, probably two or three other creatures in play, you're probably dead. I mean, <laughs> not guaranteed, but you're most Well, your dead. board's dead for sure. I mean, eh, yeah, I, I could imagine you just being dead. I mean, this is... Obviously, this, you're dead if they don't have blockers, right? But, like, yeah, who I knows? That, Maybe they can wipe, you know, I don't know if there's a wrath in this set. They could wipe their board and then wipe your board. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, generally when people cast overruns, you were pretty much... You're pretty dead. I agree. We're in violent agreement again. <laughs> um, but but here's the thing to think about is, like, we can't evaluate this mechanic off of these. Whereas with... I think that with um, Escalate, I think that that was a pretty easy... Like, this is this is multi-kicker that does something a little bit different. And that's, that's a comparison that we can make. Whereas with this, it's like, well, this isn't Eldrazi mana. Um... This isn't. What else could you compare this to? This isn't. This isn't. This isn't uh, free cards. This isn't untapped lands. You know what? It actually kind of reminds me of. Not exactly, but similar in some senses. Um, uh, the champion mechanic from Lorwyn. Okay. Um, the reason being that so the champions were at that time were uh kind of bigger creatures. Uh, but they were they were a little a little bit under costed, um, mm -hmm. right? You know, you would have like uh, Changeling was a Titan, like a seven seven for five. Um, uh, some of the like tribal champions, like uh, there was the five five for four, the Goblin one or whatever. Um, anyways, so my point is is that you would get under costed creatures that had very big stats that did usually did something very good. Titan was the only really vanilla one, I think, but it was just so big for what you could cast. Um, and you would remove a creature. Now, obviously the advantage of the champion creatures is if your opponent did something to remove the creature, the creature you had champion would come back. Um, you know, so you would, uh, you would get the creature back as opposed to, all right, well, the cre if you remove my Hushwing Griff, the creature I, uh, emerged is gone forever. But in some senses, it Retch reminds Griff. me of that. Um, Retch Griff, yeah. So in some senses, it reminds me of that, but not entirely. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if there's other... Like, I, but that's what I'm saying. Is like This is one of those. This is hard to evaluate. But don't base all of your thoughts on the limited format upon one common being spoiled, like Retch Griff. And certainly don't base it upon one mythic rare being spoiled, right? This is... There's... 
there's right now we are recording on the 3rd of July. So happy America Day, everybody, tomorrow. And there are 62 of 205 cards spoiled. Yeah, so uh, about a third-ish. Yeah. Obviously, they haven't spoiled the basic lands, but... Uh, sure. This is... this is There's so much room for this set to grow. So you got to think big picture. Think about the set at a, in a, at a larger scale. Like, don't... Don't look at a Mythic Rare and being like, well, this set sucks because this Mythic Rare is in it. That's not how Limited works, and you're going to you're gonna hate a set or love a set too much before you even get started if you think like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, Limited, uh, I mean, basically, the, and this is something I've always said about Limited, is, you know, con- if, if you're a big Constructed player, and I, I do play Constructed, you know, I'll, I'll sit there and I'll look at the rares and commons and uncommons for Constructed, and to be honest with you, there's usually not a ton of cards for Constructed. There's some, obviously, but Constructed tends to be a much more constrained uh, set of cards that will probably be good in Constructed. Uh, honestly, most rares you can probably just dismiss as not being good and constructed. Um, and some rares, like, for example, like I'm looking at the spoiler right now, there's like Niblis of Frost. You know, Niblis of Frost could be a good card and constructed. It may never see play. It's one of those cards that's maybe on the fence. Um, but then there's cards like Sanctifier of Souls that will, I highly doubt will ever see constructed play. But it's great and limited. And that's what I, that's one thing I really like about new set spoilers is you can look at all the rares and stuff and be like, oh, I bet this card's great and limited. Or I bet this card's awesome and limited. And you every single card you can look at and kind of evaluate, would I play this card in limited? And a lot of them you would be like, yeah, I would play this card in limited. Um, and I think that's one of the cool things about spoilers, for specifically for limited. Is, is that, you, that you get to be excited about more things, right? Yes. Like, and that's that's a good thing. Um, but it's important to like – it's funny because as I – when I was younger, uh, young young lad, I remember looking at the rares and being like, oh, I want to open this in my sealed pool. I want to open this in my sealed pool. And now I'm like, you know what I'd really like? I'd love three Galvanic Bombardment in my sealed pool. Like just a completely different feeling, right? That's great if I open some sweet rares. But – I'd much rather just have a solid deck. And yeah, I mean, I was I was pretty excited yesterday when I opened Archangel Avacyn and I well, yeah, but like that's <laughs> that's just gonna happen to you eventually, right? If you play enough yeah. sealed events, you're just gonna open some sweet rares. But like uh, the thing, the thing to note, like, and this is some I think we talked about this right before the uh, the last pre-release. What what's that? The Shadows of an Inshot pre-release, where we really dug in. I mean, we do this. We, for those who haven't listened, haven't been listening very long, because I know that we have a lot of new listeners, our set reviews are we do one uncommon set review where we rate every uncommon, and then we do a common set review where we talk about the our top three in each color, and those set reviews I find are really helpful for me because it's less information to digest, but it gives me the important things. Drew, why is it important that we that why don't we look at the rares and mythic rares? Why don't we look at every common? Um, I mean, so so the thing with rares is that, like, obviously you don't open as – you're not going to open a rare anywhere near as much as you are a common. Um, also, you're not going to get as much – you're not going to play versus the rares as much. Your opponent's not going to have them as often. Um, but pretty much you're going to see all the commons most likely at some point in the draft, except for the really, like, but Then why do we, only, why do we only rate our top three commons? Um, because there's a lot of commons that are what I would like to describe as maybe filler, um, and what by, by that I mean like uh, I, you know, you know, like uh, like militant inquisitor from Shadows Over Innistrad is exactly. kind of a filler common. The uh, important things to know, I think, if early on in a format, are where do the uncommons rank versus each other? Like where should I where should my baseline be? And then also, what commons need to Go, what commons are going to go head-to-head with those uncommons? Like, what are the best, like, because there are commons that do go head-to-head with the uncommons, right? And that's, that, we're giving you a baseline, right? The, we're giving you the important stuff so that you can, I, I trust our listeners. I trust people to go in there and know that a one mana one one is not playable. I trust you. I know that you know that. I know that if, if you were presented with a one mana one one that didn't do anything, you would know not to play it. I trust that if I 
presented you with a seven mana four four, you would know not to play it. I trust you to know that when I present you with a two two grizzly bear, you know that it's it's okay. You can play that card, right? I I trust our listeners to know those things, and I I feel like I get better when I am pitting those top three commons against those uncommons in each color. And I also think that learning the base of where colors are, for example, by the way, did you know Prey Upon was spoiled? I did. So this is a great thing to talk about. Let's let's do it this way. So Prey Upon is one green for a sorcerer. It's in the set. Target creature you control fights target creature you don't control. Drew, we just saw a card called Unnatural Aggression that was unplayable that did the same thing at instant speed. Uh, I think my guess is Prey Upon will be one of the best green commons. Um, obviously I can't guarantee that, but that would be my guess. Um, so, so why, what, what, so this is, this is easily a baseline green, great common for us, right? Yes. What, what makes it that? Also, you still can get some rabbit bites too, but we won't. Uh, yeah, not as many. Um, I, so, so it's just the mana cost, right? Um, I mean, one, one green versus three mana, so one versus three mana is uh, significant. It's difference. like a turn. It's like yeah. It's like taking a turn versus not taking a turn. I mean, the other thing with prey upon too is it's much easier to cast a creature and cast prey upon on with that creature in the same turn. Right. So your opponent may not even like really see it coming. You know, you can they can be like, all right, I think I'm good. They just have some two twos out, and I've got uh, three four. Uh, no way they can kill my three four. And then you go boom four four prey upon bite your guy. Can't really do that with unnatural aggression. You can, but it's much rarer. Um, and like you were talking about earlier, where uh, we have you know we ha- we have like our experience kind of guiding us as well. Prey upon was like the best green common in well, it was one of the best green commons in. The original Innistrad. Right. Um, and so it's 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 much easier for me to make the kind of statement that I am pretty confident that Prey Upon will be one of the best green commons. Can't guarantee it, but I'm fairly confident. And in fact, it's the reason that so many people evaluated Unnatural Aggression so high, right? Yes. Is because of their experience with Prey Upon. Um, and, and the thing is, is that what your jobs are, are – and then – so what I want to talk about here is waiting for the comments. Wait for the commons to be spoiled. Once you know what the top three to five commons and all the colors are, it's going to give you a much, much more realistic view of the format. Think big picture. Don't just worry about the mythic rare. I can't believe you did that right on the podcast. <laughs> they guess the mythic rare and they win. <laughs> They're the worst. Oh, I mean, sure, you can't worry about it, but like, I'm not, I, like, like I, like I'm kind of approaching a merge with hesitation, right? I'm like, I'm not really sure. This could be really bad. It could like end up me getting crushed because I merge a creature. But well, it's actually a good point, though. Now that I think about it, because like, if your entire experience against a merge is with Decimator of Provinces, then you probably think that a merge is broken. Right, but what I'm saying is that like. E- because you're talking about, in one sense, you don't want to get overly excited for certain mechanics or whatever. And I'm also saying, I think you also have to avoid, because certainly this was my approach, I think, when I was younger. You also have to avoid being overly conservative about mechanics as well, right? That's true. You, you can't just be like, oh, Emerge is terrible, I will never play an Emerge creature. Like, no, obviously I will snap play the Green Mythic because the Green Mythic will win me games, period. Like, That's true. It, there's no reason for me not to play a card that's just going to win me games, even if, if quote unquote, I had to sacrifice a creature. Oh no, I sacrificed a creature, but who cares? I won the game. Um, so I mean, you really—it's about—it's about approaching, like you're saying. You know, you want to have paradigms. You want to say things like, "Yes, I understand that creatures that fall in the vanilla." What is what does Marshall call that? The vanilla test? Is that what it is? Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or the scale, I don't know what he calls it, but the point is, is that like, you know, yes, I'm going to continue evaluating creatures, uh, based on their stats, right? Like a creature at a certain converted mana cost at, with certain stats, is is that a creature I will play? And yes, I will play it or no, I won't play it. So you're still going to approach the, uh, the format like that, but you also are open to the idea that there are mechanics that maybe jump outside of that possible paradigm that limited paradigm that we have but that you can see yes in 
in a limited game of Magic, this is an effect that I want in my deck. Or vice versa, this is an effect I don't want in my deck. And that sometimes takes some time, that takes experience, that takes the ability to understand, um, you know, not just the format, but just how to play limited games in general. So, Awesome. Let's let's talk about two more things real quick. I want to talk about understanding. We're we're entering a new world, guys. <laughs> we're entering a new world of draft. Um, we are entering. I I think we did this with we did this with Oath. So our first experience endeavor into this was with Oath of the Gate Watch. This whole two one format thing. So Drew, when we were evaluating Oath of the Gate Watch. We weren't sure what the 2-1 format was going to bring and, like, how it would affect archetypes, right? There were a lot of cards that we evaluated that were like, oh, this is good, but does it is it actually good against, like, the Blue-Red Eldrazi deck, right? Because there were still cards for the Blue-Red Eldrazi deck in Oath of the Gatewatch. So why wouldn't we think Oath of the Gatewatch? Why wouldn't we think that would still be the best deck? What we quickly learned was that instead of green still being the worst color it became the best color <laughs> and the cards that we were unlucky and not like the like cards like in in battle for zendikar that were unplayable because they were green became playable and it became kind of beautiful right if it my my memory of oath now is this beautiful thing that 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 i loved battle for zendikar and i got two brand new formats in a matter of a few months is that how you remember it yeah, I mean the, I mean certainly the archetypes. I think in Oath, like one of the archetypes that stands out for me the most in Oath was like Black White Allies, right? Which was not an archetype in uh, Triple Battle. I mean Allies was kind of there, but it yeah. wasn't like and, it wasn't. I mean, I, Red White Allies was kind of the deck there, but that was still kind of like a tier two archetype. It was like you needed certain cards for it to work together. But then Oath came out, and it was like everyone was on black white allies like everyone was like there's so many good synergies in this uh in these two colors um, and everyone was either there was definitely i felt like this feeling of drafting of the gate watch where either i'm trying to draft allies or i don't want to be in allies and so it kind of became a little bit that that's kind of how i felt about it i certainly remember that that deck being very big in uh in triple and how do you think that how do you think that oath manifested itself to me drew um i mean certainly you were much more you were like on red green weren't you yes and that's it you were all about yep saddleback quagak blood braid up <laughs> uh yeah i was i was full i mean i drafted i think every archetype in that set i drafted that set a ton but eventually i just started dra- forcing zato's commando saddleback quagak decks but that's because that's the greatest thing you could ever do. I don't know why you'd want to do anything else. <laughs> um, but what I what I'm saying is like, think of think of that. We went from a format with with triple triple battle for Zendikar, where basically you would only play green and sealed, and only if you had war callers, to a format where I was forcing green. That's a huge difference. That's the difference that two packs makes. We know what we like in Shadows Over Innistrad. We know what we don't like, but it's going to change. When you're evaluating cards, you can't evaluate them because, well, how does this card beat a... I don't even know what to say in Shadows. How does this card beat a Puncturing Light? I don't, what do you... Well, I mean, the, the one mechanic that I think um, will probably How does this be... be the Clue deck? That might be a better... Yeah, I mean, certainly clues will be uh, like Graph Mole is probably going to be a lot worse, right? Um, in in double, I'm assuming. I I haven't seen any invest. There, there's no investigate cards, right? Yeah, that I've in seen this set. Um, so I mean, again, we're we're kind of making judgments I think, I think, based on cards. No, I think cards. this is important that we're we've been you've been drafting since Legions, right? Something forever. Yeah, and then I've been drafting since. Zendikar, right? And so that we, our our limited experience uh, has changed quite a few times. If you really think about it, uh, they in in Astral, they inv- they introduced the backwards draft, right, where you draft the new set first, yes. whereas that wasn't the case before that. And now they've now and then, but it was still like one 
it was still one Dark Ascension, two, two uh, Innistrad packs, right? But now it's like, and and that was real, right? Because then your draft decks were so were not changed that much by that one pack. Um, I remember we have this exact same experience with um, uh, uh, Fate Reforged, right? Where that one Fate Reforged pack, it didn't really change the draft format that much. It changed it because people hated the draft format because the rares in Fate Reforged were so good. But like, honestly. Khan's Fate Reforged was not that different than Fate Reforged, or than Khan's draft. Than Khan's, yeah. Yeah, but with with Oath of the Gatewatch and Battle for Zendikar, they were two completely different formats. You were you were, if you got the red blue Eldrazi deck, you got real lucky, right? Like that was not a deck in Battle for Zendikar. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's certainly true, and. Yeah, and especially if they have, if they're not doing as much overlapping with uh, mechanics, with mechanics, then it certainly becomes uh, becomes the case that those mechan that certain cards that are uh, great with those mechanics get significantly weaker. Um, I think there's still madness a little bit. Um, I haven't seen as many madness spells, but there are some. Are there madness spells? Yeah, I they may not they might only be on the rares though. Oh no, there's I see one on an uncommon right now. Okay, um, that card's really good though, Chilling Grasp. Yeah, there's a I mean uh, th- there's a lot of great madness cards at the rare slot as well as a madness enabler, the uh, uh, the worst version of Wild Mongrel kind of, um, <laughs> but but I have I have not seen any investigate cards. Um, yeah, these... and I think that we're done investigating, right? We know. Oh, I guess that's true. I guess that fits with the flavor, right? Like, hey, what's going on? Why is everyone acting crazy? Oh my god, everyone's Eldrazi. <laughs> Spoiler <kind> of... alert. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that what what we're trying to say is like, we're in a new world where our only experience with this is currently Oath of the Gatewatch, right? That's it. That's our only experience into this kind of draft format, where it's a it couldn't. I think that they could design sets where it's not a major shift, but I, I don't know if this is going to be – I don't know yet, and I don't want to go out and say that I know because I don't, and I'm not going to make up my opinion upon one experience. Um, you know, Maybe after this one and the next one, if all of the two one formats are extremely different than the triple formats, then I'll confidently say eh, it's unlikely that the format will be anything close to the other one. Um, right now, I don't expect to get your clue deck. That's not happening for you. Yeah, I mean, you're, you'll still play uh, cards that are good by themselves. Yeah, you'll play Ubenwald Mysteries. You'll play... Ongoing Investigation. Yeah, you'll play those cards, but it's not the same. Yes. Um, yeah, mo- mostly, like, like Grafmo is the easy one for me to say. Grafmo probably is going to be much worse. It's still fine because it's still got a decent body, right? It falls into that, hey, this is a vanilla creature I would play by itself. Right. Um, but it's not going to be the, like, oh, man, you're gaining, like, X amount of life per turn or whatever because, you know, you're cracking two or three clues every turn and gaining six to nine life. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that that's the kind of card or, yeah, that's the kind of archetype that's certainly going to be uh, nowhere near as good or nowhere near as prevalent as it was in uh, Triple Shadows. Awesome. Let's talk about the last thing I want to talk about, and then we can wrap this up. Doing your homework. Spoiler season is a great time to learn about magic. It really, really is. It's a time where everybody's talking. Um, but do your homework. Like, learn what LSV has to say. Learn what I mean. Sp- learn what these great players have to say about cards. Um, I remember this is a little bit more constructed, but I remember uh, Paul Vitor Dama Rosa. Packard was spoiled, and he said, this card is the next Bitter Blossom. And people were like, this card is unplayable. You're an idiot. <laughs> and he was like, no, mark my words. This card is going to see play. It is broken. And people were like, no, this card is bad. Shut up. Like, <laughs> And and to be fair, the flip side, I believe LSV said, didn't he say Delver of Secrets wasn't that good of a card? Yeah, there the, – the great players get them wrong too, guys, yes. and the great players also get them right. Yes, that 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 is definitely true. Um, I mean, 
hey man, I wrote an article about Collected Company when Dragons of Tarkir got spoiled, and I said, this card is the next Factor Fiction slash Waylay, and people were making fun of me for it, like, some of my friends, they're like, oh, really, you're comparing this to Factor Fiction? And I'm like, I'm like, I had to double read it a couple times, I'm like, this card is quite good, like, this card does some pretty insane things, and hey, here we are. <laughs> the best so. card in Standard and one of the best cards in Modern. I yeah. think, and it's it's important to, like, do your homework, read what people are saying. Um, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get a ton more information right in a couple of weeks, right after the pro tour, when face-to-face -face games, pick rankings come out and Frank Karsten's pick rankings come out and like, you'll get so much information from those kind of things. Take advantage of that. Do your homework. This is a beautiful part of spoiler season. Um, but don't get caught up in the mythic rares. Don't get caught up in the rares. Enjoy I the fact that you get to play more cards because you're playing limited and enjoy yeah. the commons. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that's that's definitely, I, like I said, that's one of the coolest things I think about Limited, like I said earlier. You know, I, I can look at a card um, like, let's let's see here, um, like, uh, I'm trying to think of a card that, like, maybe... Uh, Saddleback Legac. Sure, I mean, that that's a common, but um, I'm, I'm more thinking the rares, because rares are exciting, right? Like, rare, rares are just going to, generally speaking, be more But I'm excited about Saddleback. Than, like, than, um, <laughs> um, uh, like Newscraft Mob. Like, would I play Newscraft Mob? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure I would play Newscraft Mob. This seems like a pretty decent card. Uh, it's five, it's six, it's six for a zero zero. It comes to play with five plus one plus one counters on it. Whenever a player casts a spell, you remove a counter from it. And if you do, you put a two, two, uh, black zombie token onto the battlefield. You'll never see constructed play ever. Probably won't ever. It maybe sees commander plays and some fun decks, but you know, th this is a pretty decent limited card. It's not insane, but it's, it's decent enough. I would definitely play it in decks. And that's kind of the cool, cool. thing what that about, I like. like something like Jordan rune diver, right? Um, which one? That's the two three. That whenever you cast a second spell, you drew a card. Oh yeah. Well, that that's a little bit of constructive. Play. But like, but it was more fringe constructive play, sure. And it's like it's like these cards that I I, I think that I think that it's it's so exciting for me personally, like that I can be excited about Saddleback Legac. And it's be, I hope that it's a meme one day. I hope somebody just picks a picture of me riding a Saddleback Legac off into the sunset. <laughs> Um, I put that on my wall, but like, I think that it's so cool that we can be excited about that. Yeah. I, I, I can't believe that I ever had a time in my magic career where I was like, well, this card's bad. This card's bad. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons that like when people just start cracking booster packs, you see some people cringing because you're hemorrhaging value by not playing limited. Like, Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, yeah, that's the thing. Like, you'll see, you'll see Aaron Maranaka. He'll walk around and he'll have like a, uh, you know, a, a a box, a card box, and it'll literally have like over a box of unopened packs in it, because he's just like, can we draft? Like, let's draft. <laughs> we were even joking about it yesterday. We got our, we picked up our prizes from the PPTQ, and we're like, does anybody want to draft? And Aaron's like, we're a bunch of degenerates, aren't we? <laughs> Yeah, I I want to, I like living in the world where I'm excited about opening a curse switch rather than sad about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah, because if you're if you're just opening packs just to try to get cards for constructed, you're gonna like even if you open like a box, you're gonna set aside like even for commons and uncommons. You know, unless you're like I re I want a play set of all the commons and uncommons or whatever. But like yesterday, people were opening their packs and I saw them. They they separated like two or three cards and then the rest of them were just in a you know, in a stack of cards, and it was like, yeah, like, you're, there's not, there's not a ton of cards for Constructed, there's some, obviously, um, but nowhere near, yeah, it's nowhere near as much fun as, like, getting full use out of all the cards, and yeah, and you get to think about all the different cards, and all the different interactions, and how to, how to approach, uh, just games of magic in general. Like yeah. you'd be surprised at how often I sideboarded in Inquisitor's Ox uh, when I was playing in the PPTQ. It was a lot. Like it didn't start in my main deck, but I'm like, uh, they have a lot of three and four power guys. Boom, Inquisitor's Ox. Let's get in there. Let's start blocking some guys. Like you know, Inquisitor's Ox is a really boring magic card. It's like not. It's not even a limited all star. It's just one of those things that's like, hey, how can I get a slight edge over my opponent? And it's like. Things like that, right? And Where that's exciting. That's and that's what I'm saying. Like, 
go out and do it. Go out and learn. Go out and improve. And limited is just another way to improve at Magic. So um, enjoy spoiler season, everybody. And Drew, do you have any shout outs? Um, shout out to Joe Wilkerson. Um, he's just always judging and he's, uh, always pleasant. And, uh, I like talking with him and chatting with him. Um, and he, he definitely feels like when he's making calls, he's the kind of guy that, you know, he's not, he's not there to be the bad guy, right? He's there to be like, all right, we're here to have fun. But also, let's try and keep it serious and, you know, um, understand it's competitive REL. So I, I like Joe a lot as a judge. So Awesome. Uh, I have a huge shout out to you, Drew. I have enjo- I'm enjoying doing this podcast weekly, and I appreciate you doing it with me. Um, I also just um, – this is a really hard time of the year for me. So uh, my, uh, my best friend and cousin, um, his name was Caleb Case, and – he was born on the 4th of July, and uh, he took his life a few years ago. So this is, like, a really tough time for me. And uh, I've had a lot of people give me support over the last couple of weeks and talk to me about it. Um, I won't name any names, but I, anyone who's come up to me and just like, hey, how you doing? Uh, I really appreciate it. So thank you. That means a lot. Don't forget to check out our sponsors at mtgotraders.com and uh, fivecolorcombo.com. We, I really do use that draft app, like, all the time. I, I love it a lot. I really do use MD Geo Traders all the time, and I'm really excited to see the future of Game Grid with this new store in Salt Lake City. Yep, it should be pretty awesome. So. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you guys all in a few uh, few days, a week, actually. See, see you guys in a week. Bye. They did that again, dude. What happened? Or, like, I can't see that it's recording. Like, the Skype recorder just, like, disappears. Okay, um, I think I had mine, uh, it should have been running, let me double check, recording finished, give me one second, I'm going to call you back in just a second. Okay.